Why do we serve? We serve because we just might be the answer to someone else's prayers. Because serving others is actually serving Christ. We serve others because it teaches us humility and sacrifice. In serving, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Serving blesses others, encourages others, helps others, and honors others. We serve because it is precisely what we were created to do. Good morning, Allen Bible. Uh, my name is Michael. This is my wife, Allie. We haven't had a chance to meet. And I would love to, to invite you to stand uh, and sing with us if you are able. And uh, we're going to sing a new song this morning. Um, and um, man, I know walking in here to, to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, you may walk in here with just a, there's, there could be a spectrum of circumstances, right? Like you may be flying high from an amazing week of work or with your family, or you may be walking here with just some hard things. And, um, and so what I love about this song that we're going to sing is there's a line in the chorus that I believe is just so incredibly honest. And it's something that encourages me when we sing it, but it says, it says, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. And, um, I know what you've done in your, in the, in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And, um, that may not take away the hard circumstances that we're in, uh, but it can give us a hope and a peace that surpasses our understanding of those circumstances. And so uh, we're going to sing about that victory in Christ. And I would love to just sing the chorus and just jump right on in with this one when uh, it's familiar to you. Because I'm fighting a battle You've already won No matter what comes
about this hope. And I know how the story
praise the one. Amen. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are so grateful for the debt that you paid for us. Uh, apart from you, we can do nothing, and we're here this morning to praise you for what you have done and what you are doing in our lives. So, God, we pray that this morning uh, we'll be honoring to you. Uh, you deserve it all, and uh, we are grateful to be here together to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. I have some very quick announcements. I mean, you can sit if you want, but I'm going to be less than a minute on the stage here. Look, you guys are already sitting down. It didn't take long. <laughs> promise. This is going to be short. So um, we are grateful that you are here to worship with us this morning. If you're newer, maybe it's your first time, first few times, um, we would love to get to know you and let you know what's happening uh, at Allen Bible Church. So there's a card in the seat back in front of you. Sometime this morning, fill that out, um, put it in the box there on the doors, by the doors on the way out, or give it to our connection team at the booth on the outside. we just love to get to know you, let you know what's going on here at Allen Bible Church. If you're part of Allen Bible Church, we remind each other just to give as part of our worship. You kind of know the drill. There's different different ways to do that, but we just encourage you to be um, generous to what God has given to us, back to what he's doing here through Allen Bible Church. Really only two kind of things to make you aware of. One is we are about to head into the summertime, um, which I know for a lot of, uh, especially the kids, that's very exciting. But we have kind of summer activities this, um, going on this summer for Allen Bible Church. If you want to know what's going on, sign up on our newsletter online. Give us your email address. That way we can just keep you in line with what's going on this summer. And then um, next Sunday, speaking of students and kids, we'll have a youth-led Sunday. We'll get to honor the seniors that are graduating, and students will be a part of leading our worship. So we encourage you to come back and join us for that. Our first through fourth graders are going to head back to their class now. And I told you it's going to be short. You guys can stand back up, and we're going to keep singing.
We're just grateful for the truths that we can sing in these songs, uh, God, that we can know, um, that we can have salvation through you, that we, uh, that you are our rescuer, that you sent Jesus to die in our place, um, and that we can just, again, live a life in obedience to you because of that. And God, we just uh, thank you for this morning as we open up your word, and uh, God, that it would just be something that stirs in our hearts uh, what it means to follow your son, Jesus, and um, and God, that you would just be with us this morning. And so, Father, we love you, we trust you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, my name is Buddy Lyles. It's my privilege to serve as one of the pastors here. Just want to extend my greeting to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And um, thank you, worship team. It's beautiful. Um, God designed music. He wanted it to resonate within us. And I can tell you a lot of Sundays over the last couple of years especially, um, God has used you beside me to just minister to my heart my soul, to hear you singing out, to hear us singing out together. Um, God knew what he was doing, putting us together and giving us the gift, the joy of declaring his worth and his praise. It does something in our bones as well, I think. So um, let me get my para infinalia together, as my dad would say, yeah, up here. I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, the letter of Colossians. Uh, if you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John keep going right, you'll eventually get to the great electric power company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That's where we have been. This is, that's where we conclude um, our series today um, through Paul's letter to a church, a local church, smaller than this one, because it met in somebody's house named Philemon, the church in Colossae. Um, if you get the email, which uh, Brian encouraged you to sign up for um, yesterday, we asked the question, what's the best team, the best team ever? All of you are around for the 27 Yankees, so that's probably who you voted for. Um, you've got them. They're always listed as historically one of the greatest teams ever. Um, you've got UCLA men's basketball winning like 11, 11 championships. Yeah, there you go. Um, you have the 72 Dolphins who break open the champagne every time the Patriots didn't quite get there to complete an undefeated season. 
you have the 95 to 96 Chicago Bulls, which all of us, even if you don't like basketball, you're like have nothing else to watch during COVID. And so the last dance came on and you watched every episode probably multiple times. And it's, it's interesting, right? Something like that, why are we drawn to it? Not just because we're bored during COVID, but we're fascinated by the backstories and the relationships and the, the, the components that you didn't know about and the people you didn't know about that made up that great team. Or you could add to the, the, the pile, the 2023 Rangers. I think they evidence for sure a bunch of no-namers with a few exceptions. Uh, becoming and growing into becoming a great team. I'm not a superstitious person, but I'll be sports superstitious, and I won't mention that we have two current teams that are trending in the right direction on the ice and on the hardwood. That's, that's indirect enough where it doesn't jinx them, right? <laughs> but what's the best team maybe for you? What's the, what's the best team that you've ever been on? Maybe it was like, man, it was way back in Little League, Maybe it's your team um, at your office. Maybe it's a ministry team you've been a part of here at this church. Um, what's the best team you've been on? And what was it that made that team thrive? Uh, surely, if it was a great team, it didn't just coast. You had to go through hardship, and you had to bond together, and you had moments where there was some failure, right? But, but ultimately, the team got to where it was intending to go, for certain reasons, and particularly character is what gets shown up, and then also that count-on ability, that dependability of fellow teammates, and each person kind of finding their role, you know, on the arguments of who's the, go the greatest of all time in basketball, is it LeBron or Jordan, you know, we'll say, well, Jordan was nothing without Scottie Pippen, well, it's also the same for LeBron without D. Wade, etc., right? There's always people that are lesser names. In fact, there's lots of people in the shadows of never having their name being mentioned that are important members of great teams, if you look at it. Well, I want to, um, as you think about your, you know, favorite team you were on, think about a team photo. If yours was a little league one, or maybe the office, you just took one uh, of your team. And if you could go back, could you name everybody in that photo? And then could you say, well, let me tell you about Lefty here, you know. Here's what Lefty, here's what we, we depended on Lefty for this. Or, you know, um, Sarah, she was the type teammate that always came through in this kind of situation. Like, could you do that? And as you think about a team that you've been a part of that it was a good, good, solid team experience, what was your role in that team? Some of you may have been the person out front. Um, some of you may have been the person um, as the caboose. Some of you may have been role players. Um, what was your role and what contribution did you make toward that team's goals? Well, I want to give you a verbal before we get into to, um, Paul's team photo in Colossians 4. I want to give you a verbal team photo of an incredible team that's actually uh, a real life uh, team that you've never heard of at least by their names I'm going to mention here. See if you recognize any of these names. Gordon Adam, Chuck Day, Don Hume, George Shorty Hunt. I think that's always an evidence of a good team. you got nicknames. George Shorty Hunt, Jim Stubb McMillan. Not sure why he was a stub. Bob Moak, Roger Morris, Joe Rance, John White, Jr., now, for 99.7% of you, because I think I know the 0.3% of you who know I'm talking about, these are men you've never heard of. But they are part of what was chronicled in a book in 2013 and in a movie in 2023 called Boys in the Boat. You can see uh, a faint picture in the background of all of our slides today. And it chronicles the real-life story of a nine-member rowing team. There's eight who row, so there's one alternate. And as back in 1936, the Great Depression had had us as a country still in its clutches. Um, these were a very ragtag group, um, most of them poor, most of them coming from lumberjack families. 
and they're just trying to get an education, trying to find jobs. Um, the main character is Joe Rance. In fact, th- sorry, if you haven't seen it, it's too late. Um, no. They, they become the, in the movie anyway, I haven't read the book, I'm starting the book now, that they become the B team of Washington, University of Washington's rowing team that eventually makes it all the way to become representing us in the Olympics as the United States eight-man rowing team in Berlin under the watchful eyes of Hitler. And this is the spoiler alert. We win. But that's not what draws us. The victory, that's great, but it is the compelling nature of the story of the team. And Joe Rance, um, actually the author of the book, is named Daniel Brown, and he'd written another book, and he was at some homeowners association thing, which I think this is the only redeeming thing that's happened in a homeowners thing, (laughs) said the guy who had to replace his sod recently. Um, (laughs) But Daniel Brown had this meeting, and someone walked up to him and found out that uh, he was this author of this book, and I believe it's... um, her relative was Joe Rance, really liked the, him, wanted to meet him. So he goes and meets him and finds out Joe Rance's story. And Joe is telling about the hardships of the time and trying to get into University of Washington and how you're going to pay, how you're going to eat, all that kind of stuff. And he would talk about, you know, the, the technical stuff of the early mornings and the, you know, gosh, am I even going to make this team, etc. But he said, um, Daniel Brown says, is he just talking to Joe Rance? As soon as he began to talk about the boat, he would well up. And Brown was taking notes, and, and like toward the end of this time, he said, man, I have, this has been so, you know, fantastic. I would love to meet with you more, hear your story. Would you, would you be, I would like to write about your story. And Joe Rance basically is like, no, no, no. I don't, I don't want this story to be about me. I I would be good with you writing the story, but it can't be about me. It needs to be about the boat. And Daniel Brown said at first, he's like, so the shell, like the the thing you sit in, that's what it's called, a shell, the large canoe for all of us who are rookies. And, And he goes, but then it dawned on me as he kept talking about it. He wasn't talking about the shell when he says the boat. He meant the men that he rode with. And every time he would start to talk about the men that he rode with and all that they went through together and all they had to do to learn how to be in, you know, in sync and moving in the right direction, he would just tear up. And he's like, it wasn't just this like mysterious like pastor. He said it was also that he, as he would tell it, it was as if he was rehearsing the beauty of the boat, the beauty of what they experienced, a shared experience together. And I, I'm sharing this because that was a, a team photo, if you will. I don't have an actual team photo of them. Um, you can see some partials of them in the book. But that's what we're going to look at. And if you're not there yet, get to uh, Colossians 4. Colossians 4, 7 through 18 is, is common in Paul's letters. He will end. And it's also common for people that do what I do to skip this part. Hey, we finished last week in verse 6. He mentioned some people. We're done. No, we would miss the very animating, resonating, how he keeps going, and that he never realized this, except for one time when he was in Athens, Paul is never doing ministry alone. Never. And even then, he was just waiting for them to get there. But I want you to hear that because Paul would say, here's my team photo, and don't write a story about me. But I want the story of the people you've never heard of to resonate because God works, yes, through individuals with our gifts, with our talents, with our stories, good, bad, and ugly, but he also does it through the weaving together of a team. And so in Colossians 4, 7 through 18, I'm going to read the verbal team photo of Paul that he gives us. Look there in verse 7. As to all my affairs, again, remember, Paul is in prison. 
sorry, as he's writing this. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and fellow, uh, faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. They will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These three are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. That means they're Jewish. And they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. Why? That you may stand perfect or complete and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him, Epaphras, that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that's coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. First, in this team photo, a verbal team photo, Um, Paul tells the Colossians of two beloved brothers that he sent to encourage you, verses 7 through 9. And I have the baton passed there because Paul is entrusting to them to go and be his envoy, to be his sent ones to the church in Colossae. And so, Paul, I want you to hear this. We've gone through all the doctrine in Colossians It's very high Christology that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's also the firstborn of the new creation, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. He is the embodiment of God. In him, the fullness of God dwells. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are housed. And if we are in Christ, we are new creations. He has written stout, stout doctrine to point to Jesus' supremacy and Jesus' sufficiency for all of life because they were getting an earful and the, the kind of, we'll, we'll cancel you out if you don't go our way of false teachers in Colossae, saying that's nice that you got Jesus, but here's what you need to now get in on the secret stuff, the secret sauce. Here's where your life will really take off if you'll follow my, you know, seven steps to this or that. No, Jesus is fine, but you need Jesus plus. And Paul's saying, no, you have everything you need in him. He is all sufficient and he is all sovereign because he is God in the flesh and you are in him. But I want you to note this as we start here with these two beloved brothers. Paul didn't just send a letter to address those problems of the false teaching. He didn't just write to them to tell them of his purpose, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. You can peek at that. He didn't just print off his principles. He sends them his people. As a Bible church, we need to hear that. We love our doctrinal statements and we love them all squared off and they should be. Otherwise, it'll be willy-nilly and pick what you want which feels free until you realize how enslaving it is. But I want you to note that he sends embodied encouragers. And he doesn't just send anybody. He sends those who are trusted teammates who are listed as faithful. Faithful. What's he looking for? Yes, they need to have some competence. In fact, I will tell you when we go through Tychicus, he needed to hand, handle the word and handle Paul and handle the people's questions, all that kind of stuff. But I want you to note that he sends embodied encouragers. 
He doesn't just send a letter that gets dropped off and we don't even know who the guy was. This is not an Amazon delivery person. This is a person who's going to stick around. Now, I want to tell you this as a side note. I have two goals. One is that we'd be encouraging the scriptures today. And two, that some of you would have the courage to name your children after some of these people that you and I don't want to pronounce. And the first one is one of my favorite ones, verses 7 through 9, Tychicus. Now, I also was very kind today, and I didn't have anyone be a scripture reader. When you start saying Archippus and Aristarchus and Epaphras and Tychicus, it gets weird. But man, if you name your child Tychicus, I will give a large baby gift to the person who named <laughs> Yeah, But Tychicus and Onesimus, first Tychicus, one of my favorites. How's he described? He's described... Look again in verse 7, and it's at the bottom of this here. He's our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant. I want you to note first, it's identity in Christ that is listed first. It is identity and intimacy. He's a brother in Christ. That's implied there. He's beloved. So it's his identity as one who calls on the name of Christ. And so we have unity in him no matter our background. He's a brother. Paul always starts as what he's done in the book. Who is Jesus and who am I being in Christ? I'm a new creation. Therefore, that changes my perspective. That changes my relationships. He always starts with identity and intimacy before he talks about activity and making a significant contribution. Please note that. Because so many of us today and I'm going to target us men, especially as men, we scramble ourselves to prove ourselves. That's activity. We're trying to build a brand, build an identity. The only secure identity is the one that Paul is saying here, to be a beloved brother or sister in Christ, meaning it is Jesus Christ in whom I find my security and my significance and all else, no matter what comes like we sang, they hinted at the It Is Well hymn in the Shane and Shane song. I can say it is well, no matter what comes down the pike. He's saying Tychicus is secure in Christ. And then therefore, I'm also sending you because he's been so faithful. Out of that character and identity and character, he has served. He actually uses two different words for servant or slave. And he says he's a bond servant in the Lord. He said, I've sent him for this very purpose. Why? That he might let you know what's going on here, and then he might encourage your hearts. I want to tell you his story briefly, why you should name your child Tychicus. I don't know about a girl, but a guy, yes, name him Tychicus. First of all, um, Tychicus' story briefly, he goes from a faithful co-worker, which he already was before Paul is writing. He comes to Christ um, probably uh, a few years earlier, and now he's in Rome with Paul. Um, ministering to him. He's a faithful co-worker. He goes from that to a postal delivery man, to an explainer and encourager, to an explainer of what Paul said in case they don't get it. Just like when you and I are like, I don't really understand that part of Colossians 2. Tychicus had to show up, give him the letter. It was read aloud, and he's like, All right, what in the world? Or why? You know, they might get agitated. Who knows? Tychicus has got to stand there and take it and answer it and explain it. And then he's got to encourage their hearts. Paul has a pastoral heart. He's like, you know, though I haven't seen most of your face, I, I, I have this deep affection for you that, that the Lord would knit you together in love. And I know there this, this false teaching is trying to pull you apart, and I want Tychicus to come and be part of that, making sure we kind of weave together where it's trying to fray. Elsewhere in, in Scripture, uh, he's mentioned, we'll show you a couple slides here. He's mentioned as part of the team in Acts 2, next slide. There, along with the Aristarchus, Timothy, uh, Gaius, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Okay, so he's mentioned there, traveling with Paul. The next slide. In Ephesians, is very similar to what we have here in Colossians. When Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, which is not too far down the road, he says, hey, Tychicus is going to explain what's going on here. He's a beloved brother, faithful minister, same thing. I've sent him this very purpose. He may know, you may know about, about us, and he may comfort your hearts. Then a little bit later, in Titus, when he writes to Titus, in Titus, the purpose of, of Paul writing to Titus, a young pastor, and that, 
island of Crete. He says, I'm writing that you might appoint elders, set things in order and appoint elders. There was a lot upsetting families in that culture. In fact, they were a couch potato culture, much like ours, who sat around. They didn't have screens, but just sat around doing that equivalent. And they're therefore a lifestyle of live for yourself, self-indulgence. And he says, Titus, you need to set those things in order. There's a lot that needs order. You're going to need to appoint some, some, some godly men of character who can silence the false teachers, refute the false teaching, confront it, but also do so in ways that adorn the gospel. That was the situation. And he said, by the way, Titus, I want you to come here and I'm going to get either Artemis or Tychicus to you. What is he saying? Tychicus is going to go as an interim substitute pastor. Now, my wife is a substitute teacher. She can tell you the substitute teacher isn't treated quite the way the regular teacher is. Y'all know you tortured your substitute teacher. But Tychicus has to not only be able to handle the word enough, he has to have the, the spiritual backbone and fortitude that comes from a secure identity in Christ and having traveled with Paul and gone through the stuff of ministry and to prize enough preserving the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace to go to a place like Crete where couch potatoes ruled and everybody gets easily offended and they're all about themselves. It sounds so much like now. And he says, now go be a substitute pastor there for a few months. And then in 2 Timothy, I don't know if I have it. Yeah, I do have it. He's telling, this is Paul's last letter. He's in his second imprisonment now. He's like, the end is coming. I'm facing it. Timothy, you're my dear brother. Come to me as soon as you can. We're going to talk about Demas in a minute. He's bailed on me. I sent all these other guys everywhere. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. He's going to go where Paul was the pastor for about three years, and Timothy has been the pastor, two stout men of God who handled God's word. And Tychicus, you get to go be the substitute pastor there. Now, it's one thing to be a substitute teacher or pastor somewhere that, you know, we kind of been just kind of skating by. He's like, look, you're going to go and um, where Chuck Swindoll and Tim Keller and Matt Chandler, they've all been preaching. Now you go, Tychicus, and you handle it. Why do I say all that? Well, because what is commended, or you would have never heard of Tychicus. He would have been like Stubb in the boat that nobody ever heard of him. But Paul says, you, you want to know how vital and valuable this guy is? And why is he vital and valuable? Not because he can, you know, parse Greek verbs. It's because of his faithfulness and character. The radiance of Christ through his life. He's a faithful servant. The question is, could that be said of you? And oh, 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 that we had more Tikkakai in our, in our day. Seriously. We have so many people, and Tikkakai should be a stab at us. He took the job of going to deliver letters. In fact, much of your New Testament you have because Tychicus, at least Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon, came from him. But he took a menial job, if you will, that then Paul tagged on. Oh, and by the way, while you're there, here, also do this. But how often do we shy away from, well, that's beneath me. Well, I can't set up chairs. And when I was at Dallas Bible um, years ago, I was the young adults pastor, and we're closer to Dallas Seminary. So I had several seminary students coming up and being part of our ministry. I'd love that. But I'd have people show up in like week two. They're like, hey, now I wanted to lead um, a Bible study here. I'm like, hey, next week, there's a group not led by me, but amongst our leadership that prays about an hour and a half before everybody else gets here and they help set up the room. Why don't you just come join us there? About 1% of those people showed up. So just wait. I had a guy, a friend from seminary when Stonebriar Community Church, which is Chuck Swindoll has been the pastor for now a long time. They were planting it. Okay. When you're Chuck Swindoll, you don't plant a church. It was like 2,000 people immediately. And this friend called me. He's like, holy cow. Like, so like you're a singles pastor, young adults pastor. Like, like I'm supposed to be in charge of that. But I already have like um, 
80 to 100 people here, and they're all wanting to lead things. And, let, and I said, hey, no one else would tell you this, and this will sound unbiblical, but I'm going to tell you, don't do squat. Have a boring Bible study that they can come to or not come to. Encourage them to set up chairs, show up early and pray, but don't, give any, don't put anyone in leadership for like six months. Other than, I mean, he already had a couple people that, that you know, were trusted. But like these people were coming from all these other churches. You don't know why they left those churches. And he came back to me later. He's like, thank you so much for telling me that because some of those very people are like, well, I, you know, I mean, look at me. I'm, I'm THM, blah, blah, blah. You know, here I should be teaching this Bible study. Those people flaked and left. And the people who rose to the top were not the people trying to clamor to the top. The people who rose to leadership, it was a leadership that was because they were faithful servant leaders. And in our culture, we think, well, that's beneath me, or I should get this, I should get mine by now. That should not be named in the church of Jesus Christ. And I think most of you would agree with that because you wouldn't be here with a no-name, non-famous pastor. So thanks for coming today. <laughs> Secondly, we're not going to spend much time on him. Onesimus. Name your child Onesimus. That might be braver than Tychicus. I don't know. We've already gone through him, so I'm not going to say much. But we covered his story a couple weeks ago. We were going through the letter of Philemon, who was the host of the Colossian church. And Onesimus was his runaway slave who had wronged him, probably stole from him. He made it to Rome where he met the Apostle Paul. He came to faith in Christ. Paul writes a letter to appeal called Philemon, 25 verses. You could read it right now. And he writes to Philemon to say, you knew him basically as a slave, but now I'm appealing to you to accept him as a brother. That was also read aloud in the church community. So now Philemon has a choice. His life has changed, Onesimus. He has come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's been transformed by the grace of God, but he did wrong me. How do I respond? How will I treat him? I want you to note one thing, we're going to move on, because we've already covered him. It's interesting that in these three verses of Tychicus and Onesimus, he calls Tychicus twice a slave. He does not call Onesimus a slave, or he calls Tychicus a servant and a bond servant. He calls Onesimus a faithful and beloved brother who is one of your number. Not just Philemon, Colossian church. How will you receive one who we all know his dirty laundry is flying in the wind? How will you treat him? My question for me and for us is what if someone you know with a seedy or sinful past, they've really blown it, comes to trust Jesus as Savior, or maybe they were already a believer, but they've come to that point where they are licking the pavement, prodigal son, I don't even deserve this, but Lord, would you take me back? How do you treat them? How will you treat them? How will we receive them? Because a change in uh, the life of that person calls for a change in relationship with us. From these two beloved brothers to six teammates who send their greetings, the first three are Jewish men, the next three appear to be Gentiles. The first team member who sends his greeting is, I'm calling a thick and thin friend, not thick and thin, but through the thick and thin, Aristarchus. That's a very bold name. We all need friends like Aristarchus who stick with us through thick and thin, through the good the bad and the ugly times, I bet you have somebody you could name. My hope is that every one of us would be such a friend that if that ever, anything was ever caving around one of our friends, we would be a thick and thin Aristarchus for them. Just a little bit about him. He was a Jewish believer from Thessalonica. He probably came to faith when Paul was on his second missionary uh, journey there, and then he p potentially began to um, travel with him. He first appears in the biblical record as a traveling companion of Paul in Acts 19 in Ephesus. It's a great story. I'm just going to give you a couple of sentences on it. Paul was preaching. People were uh, coming to faith. Um, and as he's sharing the gospel, people coming to faith are abandoning their idols, their literal physical idols. And this was bad business for the silversmiths in town. You want to get 
um, the hostility of the business community. Just make sure that people are coming to faith in Christ and now they don't cheat in their business. Or they don't, basically their business was, was booming as long as people were idol worshipers. And so they get ticked off and um, they, they stir up a riot. And they threaten Paul and his team. And Aristarchus and Gaius, two men, they were right in the thick of that rumble, and they were dragged into the Ephesian amphitheater, which you can still see today. Not this video of this, but the, the amphitheater. They were dragged in by the worked up and confused rioters, and they were almost martyred. Aristarchus was almost martyred. And Paul calls him a fellow prisoner. Now, that mean, may mean he was also under house arrest in Rome with Paul, or it may mean at least that he stuck with Paul even as he's in prison and most people run. He was not ashamed to continue to visit and serve Paul if he wasn't a prisoner. He was, um, he was willing to be there for him at his side. We all need Aristarchuses or Aristarchi in our lives, and someone needs you to be an Aristarchus for them. You may feel like, ah, I don't have what it takes. You might be the very person that God has put next to somebody who's really hurting, who's really going through it. And they need your availability. You're there. They need your listening ear. They need maybe an encouraging word, but don't, don't fret over that. Just be there and let God supply by his grace what you might need to be that thick and, through thick and thin friend that they can count on. Next, we come to Mark, the restored co-laborer. John Mark's story Early on, he's a young man. Uh, he was doing well with the Lord. He started out strong enough that he was, went on a missionary journey with Paul. But at some point, it got too tough for little John Mark. And he bailed on Paul. Later, when Paul was about to embark on another missionary journey, he and Barnabas are getting together. Barnabas wanted to bring his cousin Mark along. And Paul said, no way. Mark had tanked, and Paul didn't trust him. And they had a sharp disagreement. Some of you get nervous about that. They were at it and at each other, and they split. And God, through that split, I'm not saying God's saying it was a good split or not, but all of a sudden he multiplied two teams because Paul took somebody else and Barnabas took Mark, and two missionary teams went out. Sometime later, thanks to Barnabas's encouragement, as well as possibly the Apostle Paul's investment in little John Mark, um, Peter, who knows himself what it's like to fail because of lack of nerve, in, in, you know, poured his life into Mark some, and now Paul is mentioning Mark as part of his team again. And several years from this writing, Paul will describe to Timothy in 2 Timothy that Mark is useful to me for ministry. The guy who flaked has been reinstated. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of you have flaked. You have tucked your tail. You think you are unreachable or unuseful to God. He says, oh, I delight in redeeming and transforming. And then that becomes part of your story to help soften the ears and the heart of others who might hear of my grace. You need to hear maybe that you don't have to continue being the guy who blew it, the gal who couldn't stick with it. You can start your life afresh today with Jesus. Kent Hughes puts Mark's story in words of hope that we all need to hear. He says, what encouragement we find in the life of Mark. Past failure, even rejection, does not prevent present usability. Let me say that again. Past failure or current failure even rejection does not prevent present usability. You can come back from disgrace and be immensely useful to Christ. Even a shirker can become a major worker in the gospel enterprise, the kind of man or woman the Apostle Paul would call for. The last one, Jesus called justice, committed no matter the cost. Why did he go by justice instead of Jesus? Go figure. A little hard to live up to that name. Uh, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus called Justice were the only three of the circumcision who proved to be an encouragement to Paul. Interesting word used for encouragement here. We get our word paragoric from. 
It's a medical term. It's used of medicine that brings relief from pain. So Jesus called justice was one of those three who was a source of steadying comfort and relief in the midst of a lot of pain that Paul personally physically went through as well as emotional ostracization. I can't even say it. You know, he's put on the outs and justice was part of that. The next three are most likely Gentiles. Notice Paul's ministry team, not only was he not alone, his ministry team embodies the very gospel unity that he calls for and declares is what we are and who we are in Christ. You don't just have an identity in Christ, we have a we identity in Christ. He has three Jewish co-workers and three Gentile co-workers as part of his major inner circle team. Don't miss that. If you peek up to Colossians 3.11, 3.10, we're a new creation, and what that looks like is that there's no distinction in the body. All those things that we want to classify one another on, stay to our corners, away from each other. He says, no, we are unified in Christ. And his team exemplifies that. Well, the first one um, of these that is part of Paul's ministry together on purpose, the first man prioritizes and prays along with Paul for a singular purpose. His name is Epaphras. Another cool name. Verses 12 through 13. Um, Epaphras, who is one of your numbers. Second time that's said. A bond slave of Jesus Christ. He sends you his greetings. What does he do? Always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. It's likely that there is a church in Colossae because Epaphras came to faith in Christ in the Ephesian area and went back to the Lycus Valley and shared Christ there in Laodicea and Hierapolis and people came to faith and now there's a church and Epaphras was likely the first shepherd of that community but he'd gone to visit Paul and now he's in prison with him. We don't know again, is he chained or is he just there? And he needed to share with Paul. Here's some of the things concerning. Paul makes sure to do two things. One, I wanna make sure you know Epaphras isn't a tattletale. And I want you to know really what he does is he wrestles in prayer. That's the word, we get our word agonizing from this. He agonized on the mat for them. Why, what is he praying for? Not just, oh God, be with them. Nothing wrong with that. He says he's earnestly, he's vigorously, consistently, always praying for you, what? That you may stand fully assured in all the will of God. You know what that matches? Paul's purpose. He says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, that we may present every man or woman complete in Christ, or the word to be perfect. It's the same idea here. What Paul's purpose is, Epaphras is aligned with. And you know his main contribution is he's hitting his knees constantly by name, by specific thing that trips that person up, where they're growing and he wants them to be encouraged. He's praying, he's wrestling in prayer with purpose. Next, Luke. Luke is a friend who gave constant care. Sorry, Luke and Demas. Luke is a friend who gave constant care and Demas is a friend who gave out. He's on the team now, but he gives out. A uh, quick word on both men. Luke is a friend who gave constant care. He's the beloved doctor. Uh, he sacrificed to travel with Paul on many of his journeys, likely ministered to Paul, Paul's physical well-being as a doctor while also a trusted source of care as a friend and coworker in Christ. We have the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, thanks to Dr. Luke. And then Demas, a friend who gave out, we can add the rest of his story because he is a warning to us. He's a friend who gave out. Um, he also sends his greetings. He's a trusted member of his team at this point. And think of Paul. At this point, he's trusting, and he's seeing Demas' faithfulness. Think of what Paul was envisioning for Demas' future ministry. And then realize that sometime after this writing, Demas deserted Paul and the cause. In 2 Timothy 4, there's a striking contrast between Demas. It says, having loved this present world, he deserted us. He deserted Paul and the cause of Christ. That's in contrast with the verse before it in 2 Timothy 4, 8, talking about those who have loved Jesus' appearing. And so they're arranging their lives around being alert that I might be at the ready to meet him face to face. So I'm aligning my life and arranging my schedule 
and all that I give my attention and energy to, to being rewarded for faith for faithfulness to him on that day. The very next verse, Demas, in contrast, not prizing that, but having loved this present world, bailed, deserted, abandoned. And if we jump into that Second Timothy story, we can feel the ache in Paul as he says that, the stinging disappointment that won't go away, how his loneliness in prison is magnified by Demas choosing to love this present world more than Jesus and his mission. And I want to say this. It's easy for us to throw Demas under the bus. But the story can easily become my story or your story. In what area of your life or lifestyle are you in danger of becoming a Demas? Our world has a lot to draw our attention and affection. What does the allure of this world or where does it grab your affections? How are you enamored with the cravings of our culture? And you know right this morning that it's causing you to drift away from Christ. And you even know down deep, I know that life that's truly life is in Christ and following him with my whole heart. But right now, I just need to take the edge off. Right now, I got to get mine. It's a deception and a lie. Let Demas be a warning. Paul finishes with encouragement to the Colossians and to us as a church to live together in grace and together on purpose. Verses 15 to 18. First, um, one more up. There we go. First, he tells them uh, to, to greet Nympha uh, and the church that is in her house. Uh, I can tell you I'm not nerdy enough to know which one. Greek scholars aren't either. They argue whether or not Nympha is a man or a woman because of the pronouns and whatever. Just know that he names another person who is hospitable to host the church in their house. Think the size of a life group. And he says, I want to, I want to recognize the value of hospitality for the strengthening and encouragement of the church. And he says, and you're not alone. There are other churches in the area. I've written letters to them. Y'all swap the letters back and forth. There was some sense. They didn't have the Bible, do we had it? But there was some sense that Paul being an apostle, if he spoke it, God sent it to them. And realize you're not alone. You're part of the big C church. And be encouraged by that. And then be encouraged that you have some of the same struggles. And so know that you're not uh, alone. You're in grace together. And then verse 17, Archippus. He's a friend to encourage in ministry. He tells the Colossian church, say to Archippus, take heed, or literally it's give ear to, the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Notice, Paul enlists the church community in Colossae to encourage and spur on Archippus. He doesn't just say, all right, now tell Archippus this. Like, sorry, he doesn't just say, Archippus, do this. He says, I want you to say to Archippus, there's accountability, there's encouragement, there's also recognition of them going, Archippus, we see that this is the ministry you've received in the Lord, and we confirm it and affirm it. When Paul talks to Timothy, he says, fan into flame the gift of God, or kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. What is that? That's the elders there recognizing, or leaders in that church, commissioning, putting their hands on saying, we identify with you and we appreciate and recognize you have this ministry, this part of the team, and we'll play our roles alongside of you in that. He's, he's saying the same thing. He says, Archippus, you've got a ministry that's from the Lord. And then lastly, Paul's saying, I'm not alone. I'm thankful for you. Remember me in the same, or verse 18. Probably Timothy was writing the letter. Paul didn't write much. He had an amanuensis, a secretary, to write most of his letters, but he would almost always pick up the stylus and write in very large letters. Hey, I want you to know this is Paul. He says, remember me in my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Paul himself is modeling for us, realizing you need others. Ministry is not to be done alone. He says, remember me in the slammers. When he says remember, he's like, not think a thought. He's actually inviting them to pray like Epaphras for him. So what? Well, God calls us to be a team together in grace and together on 
purpose. This passage, whether you realize it or not, as Paul gave us this team photo, he's saying, if you're in Christ, you're part of the team photo. This answers the three core questions of every human heart. Who am I? Which is a question of identity. Where do I fit? Where do I belong? It's a belonging question. And what contribution can I make? What difference can I make? And that's a question of purpose. And Paul weaves those together. He says, we are all together in grace. We can do nothing apart from grace. Our identity is in Christ. So a couple of things I want to say. As he goes through this team photo, number one, the gospel changed life, changes everything. Colossians 3, 10 and 11, you're a new creation in Christ. If you've come to faith in him, you are a beloved brother and sister. And that is your primary identity. In Christ and we identity, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, a family. Secondly, life change is possible, and maturity in Christ is the goal. Life change is possible. Onesimus, a former runaway slave, now is a brother in Christ. Receive him back because he's one of your number. Mark, the one who blew it, like every one of us in here could name when we have blown it. And you thought you were the only one. He says life change is possible, and maturing in Christ is the goal and Mark is a great example, living, now dead, but living at the time, example of someone who had bailed, but someone who God restored and is useful to ministry. And some of you need to hear that. And then we need to hear the warning of Demas. Life change is possible, but it's not inevitable in terms of our response and which way we go with the life that we have in Christ. Third, there are no nobodies in the body of Christ. A friend of mine years ago said, when you think about the body and all the organs, there's no appendix. We don't know what the appendix does, except for it really hurts if you've got to get it taken out. But you can live without it. There's no appendix in the body of Christ. You are useful. You are part of the team. You're in the team photo, whether you're like begrudgingly in the team photo, you're in the team photo. And you're part of the team. You're in the boat. And every one of us has to row. And we have to row in the same direction. You are vital and valuable in the body of Christ. And like Archippus, God has called you to a ministry. And today, he's saying, take heed to it again. You're like, well, I don't know what that is. I'll say two, two things we say around here a lot. How has God wired you? Are you a people person? Are you a task person? If the waiter spills the tray of you know, dishes at the restaurant? Do you quickly go clean up or do you go uh, encourage them or do you go and pay the bill for them? That's a clue as to your wiring. But the second question is where, are, where is he located you? Where do you live? Your address is not an accident. You put those two things together and you're a long way down the road to how can I faithfully serve? And if you don't know, start setting up chairs. Show up early to pray. Ask, hey, how could I help? When we say we need, you know, help uh, in our kids' ministry, raise your hand. When we say at Life Group, when they're like, gosh, we'd love to do this, but we're going to be out of town, and we're usually the host. Offer to host in your house. But there are no nobodies in the body of Christ. And then lastly, somebody around you might be on the road drifting, or on the water drifting toward being a Demas or they just are a mark and they feel like they've blown it. And maybe God is calling you to be their encourager. Be the embodied encourager that he's sending today to listen, to weep with, to rejoice with, to be alongside, to wrestle in prayer with, and to spur on. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. We're gonna sing to close. None of this is possible as Paul ends it. Grace be with you. Us living a life of significant service is not possible apart from the grace of God. In John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I don't know where you are today, but God, like Paul, didn't just send a doctrinal statement and a bunch of rules and do's and don'ts. He sent the person of his son, Jesus Christ. 
to show us what God is like, full of grace and truth. And he's saying the good news of Christianity is it's not get your life together and behave. It's what we sang earlier. Behold him and believe that he took your place on the cross for the awfulest thing you did or will do so that we could be made new in Christ. I want you to stand um, while they're still getting strapped on. I'm going to read you a benediction from a couple of sections in Colossians. And then we'll sing, Yet Not I, and you will be close. We'll end when we're done with the song. Yeah. The benediction. I pray for you along with Epaphras and Paul that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in your knowledge of him, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted, now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. And whatever you and I do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Change is already I can see I am.
have a great week.